denied him when he whispered into your life and said, I bought you. I bought you, he says. This morning is the morning that you get a story, that you get a testimony, that you find out who God truly is. Well, I understand that many of you have been saved for longer than I've been alive. I want you to be reminded this morning of your story. To be reminded of how God has fought the battles for you. To testify of His goodness. For those who have been in church longer than I've been alive, don't tune me out. You see, the gospel is still the gospel truth today, just as it was 50 years ago when you accepted Christ yourself. The gospel is still the same gospel that Paul preached all across the area so that others might know him. The gospel truth is still the same today. And because it's still the same today, it still has the same power, it still has the same effect, it still has the ability to save. We begin this morning with first looking at what God has accomplished on the cross and how we're able to be a part of that saving grace, but we find ourselves first in a story. The story of how God shows up in a mighty way. Turn with me to Acts chapter 16. It will be on the screen for you as well. I read out of the English Standard Version. I hope that you have a Bible that, that is a good translation that you understand with you. Acts 16.25 is where we begin. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. What a story the jailer has. What a testimony of God showing up. Here he is guarding. He's actually sleeping, if you read the text. And he's thinking everything was secure. That everyone's in their chains. Everyone is fastened to the wall or whatever the jail might have looked like. And then this earthquake comes. You know, God is kind of that way. Whenever he enters a life, he kind of is like an earthquake. I'm not saying that he is destructive in a bad way, but he, he kind of changes things, doesn't he? You remember at the, uh, after he breathed his last on the cross and, and the tombs split open and dead people are walking from the earthquake? Amazing, isn't it? But here he shows up in an earthquake again. And, and in all of his power showing up in this earthquake, quake, it opened the doors of the jail and freed the prisoners from their shackles. We see God showing up in a prison. Did you know that prison ministry is a dirty ministry? But it's not for our God. I have a friend down in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and he has the privilege now of preaching and proclaiming the gospel in, down in Arkansas at the, the state penitentiary to those on death row. They don't even get to get out of their cells. He sits in a common area as they listen and hear him preach the gospel truth. Prison ministry is hard and dirty, but our God shows up in the prison, doesn't he? And he came so that he might set them free. 
The response of the jailer is very significant to the story. He, he knows that he should not have been sleeping. He knows that his head is on a spit, so he raises his sword to cut his own throat, kind of an honor-killing kind of thing, saying that, that, that I'm not going to let them take my life. I'm going to take it myself. The Romans aren't going to touch me. He didn't want to be dishonored. He had a family at home to take care of. Apparently he had children of some age in the household because he talks about the entire household being saved. So he doesn't want to bring shame on his name either. But Paul cries out, don't do it. Do not do it. We have hope for you. You see, that's the significance of the gospel message, is that it is the hope of life to come. It is the hope of eternity with our God. It is a hope. And in our faith, we trust that our God is who He says He is. How many of you have had a Paul cry out to you and say, wait, trust in your life. We talked about suicide in our mental, uh, our mental health week here at, at, uh, with the youth, and I talked about suicide and suicidal rates and issues, personal issues and experiences. And Paul wants him to see that his life is still worth something. That his life means something. And that he has a purpose. Many a Christian today would, in their anger towards the individual who has shackled them to the wall with, without justice, would say, be gone with you. But Paul does not do that. He cries out to him and says, do not do it. And he shares the hope of Christ with him. The jailer, he runs in with lights and falls, gets them out, and he falls at the feet of Paul and Silas, and He's begging for salvation. I'm not sure he understands at this point exactly what he's begging for. But it does seem as though he had heard the singing and the praising that had been going on by Paul and Silas and the other jailers as they're proclaiming the truth of the gospel in the prisons. Maybe he just wanted to be saved because the other option was much worse. I don't know, but I do know that they spoke the truth about Jesus to him. And, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Do you see the significance of what they are telling him? They are sharing the hope of Jesus Christ with them as the earthquake has just shaken and the power of God in his presence has entered into the prison. And not only did it break things apart, but it unlocked the shackles and the chains that were on them. The Holy Spirit doesn't need a key to unlock a lock. They told him of hope and assurance of what had happened on the tree in Golgotha. This, this salvation was not just given to the rest of the family, no, because, because dad believed not at all. It's not exactly at all what it is. But we do know that something like 90 plus percent of the time when a husband trusts their life to Jesus, the mom and kids also are converted. I think Barn is somewhere up around 93 to 95 percent. It shows the impact a man in the home has on his family. Dads, husbands, grandpas, do you trust Jesus with your life? Because your kids are looking to you, your grandkids are looking to you, the kids who are we bring in on Wednesday nights who have no family here whatsoever, they are looking to the men. If you watch them, they're looking for a man that's going to show them value and that's going to tell them the truth. You have such an impact on the faith of your children, men, on the children that God has brought to your presence. Sometimes at Team Kids, those boys just need a dad because they don't have one.
Your family will not succeed in their faith without you playing an active role in the faith of your family. But then this party begins. They rejoiced together. They celebrated their faith. They had joy in their hearts just as we should today. We should be reminded of what we have been rescued from. A literal place called hell that we have the opportunity to glorify God. That he chose us that we might choose him and say yes to him. And that's where we come to this morning. What does it require of you and I to be saved? Romans chapter 10 tells us very plainly this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart one believes and is justified, and with a mouth one confesses and is saved. It does not say that you might be or that it's a possibility that you will, but when you fully trust in Jesus Christ and you hand your life over to him for the very first time, you get to experience a newness in life. A rebirth, something that starts over. The testimony of the young lady that you just saw, um, and that's on a, a church website out in, the, out in, I think, North Carolina. And as I was hunting for a testimony to show this morning, I, I was just overtaken by her story. I don't know if you caught it or not, but, but she was through foster systems and all of those things abused, and, and she came to live with her family and And she got tired of the baby screaming and she dropped the baby and it killed it. She was in juvenile facility for five years is what her sentence was. I'm going to say usually they will transfer them out by 18, so 18 to 21. So she's probably in the the realm of, of 12 to 15 years old when she does this. She has had zero men that have been positive influences in her life. If you heard what she said, she said that she hated God because she thought God did this to her. You see, oftentimes what we find with young people is that their view of God is how they view their dad or the lack thereof. Because if my earthly father doesn't love me, how could one that I don't know, how could he love me? Jesus comes to heal the sick and the lame. and Why? Because they're the ones that need a doctor. Those who knew they were sick. Sinners like you and me. Sinners, plain old sinners like you and me. I don't know any of you who have taken a life before, but I can guarantee you just by knowing you that we have all sinned. And in that sin, that one sin, it makes you unrelatable. It makes you exist out of the presence of a holy God. Without the blood covering of Jesus Christ, there's no hope. To confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord is to know salvation. In this polytheistic world today, we try to find every way that we can to salvation without first admitting that we needed saving in the first place. You can look to Middle Eastern traditions. You can look at at some of the, the... far off ideas, new age ideas of how you become a believer, the how you get to an eternal something, paradise, whatever they list it as. But our God says that every single one of those ways is false. The only way to heaven, the only way to God is through eternal life with Jesus Christ. Our culture has many gods in which we used to try and attain success or freedoms here on earth, never concerned of the longest part of your life, eternity. 
You know, we just try to try to live our best for the 80 years plus or less that you live here. But we don't think about eternity. This long, long stretch of unending time. You've all met people, some of you could be these people that say, I don't need help. That you don't need someone to save you. That you got this. But let me tell you something this morning. You need help. You and I, we need help. It was unattainable on ourselves. The whole idea of the law is to show the need for God to step in in his mercy and provide a a sacrifice that we might know him. I don't know about any of you, but I've eaten pork this week. Have you? Yes, amen. I like pig. I don't know about any of you, but, but you've, you've not eaten in kosher way. Maybe you dipped your meat in milk. Do You see, the law is a lot of things. But the law is, is necessary so that it would show that you and I could never attain what God could provide. You see, without help, you will never see salvation. You know, you need Jesus. But oftentimes, until you're at the bottom, you won't even give him the time of the day. How many of you, and I've done this time and time again, walk into a, a hospital room or a sick, sick person or the nursing home, and, and you know that they are not church people whatsoever? But what do they ask the pastor? Or what do they ask the leader from the church to do? What do they ask? They ask you to pray for them. To pray for them. You need help. You need help. The jailer, it took God showing up in an earthquake and the jailer's life to be threatened before he would call on the name of Jesus. What's it going to take you? Is it going to take time in jail? Is it your marriage to be on the brink of failure, financial ruin, the dreaded cancer diagnosis? What will it take for you to finally turn your life over to Jesus? And I'm not just saying a little piece of it or this area of it, but what will it take for us to say, Here is everything. The crazy thing is, is that while we need God, He does not need us. But instead, He chooses us. Do you see the difference? He does not need us. He does not just he can't, it's not that he can't function without us. He did it for uh, eternity past before he created the earth. But he wants you. What would happen in your life if you understood this morning, maybe for the very first time, that God wants you? That he loves you? You see, the greatest thing about the testimony is that we saw in the video is that, is that she realized that God wanted her. God desired for her. God wants you. Because He loves you. Your dad may have been the worst man on the planet. Maybe your husband cheated on you and hurt you so bad that it's irreparable. Let me tell you, though, there is a God. He so cherishes you that he chose to pay the highest price that you might be purchased from the most terrible of places. That you might be taken from the darkness of the kingdom of hell into the light of the kingdom of our God. 
that you would not experience the eternal punishment that is the casting out into the fire we read in Revelation of, of God's final battle and he, he throws Satan into this lake and, and it's all completed and finished. What would happen in your life if you understood that God wants you? You see, the value of an item is contingent on what people are willing to pay for it. Sure, you would like to sell your house for $300,000, though it's a shack in Dade County. But no one's going to pay it unless they're silly people from, uh, we used to call them Californians. <laughs> Sorry, Rod. <laughs> That's what we used to call them whenever they come by farmland, but yeah. They took them. But the value of an item is contingent on what people are willing to pay for it. When you sell calves at the yards, they are only worth what someone else is willing to pay for them. The same thing is here. We are only worth what God was willing to pay for us, but He paid it all. Stepping down from heaven, He was crucified and beaten to a pulp, but you were worth it. He saw value in you. He saw purpose in you. And so he was willing to pay the ultimate price that you might experience faith with him and a hope everlasting. Sinner, can't you see that God bought you? That he wants you? That he longs for you? You must simply believe. You must simply believe. Why? Because your sins are washed clean. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. He's the oxyclean of the sin world. You see, blood was required for the sin offering, and He has shed His blood so that you might finally know Him, the one perfect Lamb who was crucified, that we might have everlasting life. That you might gain access to God for the first time. If you remember the tearing of the veil and the opening of the Holy of Holies, so that uh, signifying that we now have direct access to God. You don't have to come through me, you don't have to come through an elder or a deacon or a priest. Our God now welcomes us into his presence as his children. you might say I trust you and I believe in you save me oh God have you ever cried that out before save me oh God David cried that out in the Psalms all of the time and when he was sinking and in trouble and his own family, his own children that he neglected and, and just, just wasn't a great dad with were trying to take over his kingdom. And Psalm 69, I read it during our, our time of Scripture, but I want to read the first three verses again. It says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. Do you see the desperateness of him waiting that he would save him? If you read on down, God answers him. And, and we see through David's life that he had faith that one day the Messiah would come. But my question to you this morning is, will you cry out to God this morning, save me, O God? Why should you call out to Jesus? Because He's the well of eternal life. While Melissa and I were on our honeymoon in St. Augustine, Florida, there was a tour you could take on you bought a three-day bus pass, and you could get off at all these different locations. I think there was 40 or 45 locations. It's a very historical city. And, 
and you could get off, and every 15 minutes, another trolley would come back around to pick you up. And so you got to see all these sites. So you could stay there all day if you wanted to, if you got off and thought, well, this is hokey pokey. Then you could get back on the tram in 15 minutes, and you could get out of there. You didn't have to stay. You didn't have to drive anywhere. It was awesome. It was amazing. But we went by this one place, and you'll see it up here on the screen. And this is the Fountain of Youth that was supposedly discovered or talked about by Ponce de Leon, who was the discoverer of St. Augustine. It's the oldest city in the nation, they say, all those things. They have lots of claims. But you were to drink out of this water, and really the story comes from the Native Americans that were down there. They lived to be old. They were tall. Uh, Ponce de Leon was only about this tall. I mean, he was extremely short. And um, they died, those back then, they died within the uh, around 40 at the oldest. Whereas the Native Americans who were in that area lived to be 100 plus years old. And so they thought if they drank the same water, you know the whole story of this well. But they had this fountain of life, they so called it. But its waters seemingly only extended lives according to the tales. It did not bring with it eternity. It was just enough to drink right then, and I heard it wasn't very good. We didn't drink out of it, so we're going to get we're going to die young, maybe. But we have a story of a woman and Jesus at a well that provided water for generations before, but it would one day dry up. I want to read you Jesus' response to her as they're talking to a Samaritan woman and himself, or talking at this well uh, that that her generations before her relatives had built says jesus answered her if you knew the gift of god and who it is that is saying to you give me a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water the woman said to him sir you have nothing to draw water with she's like you idiot and the well is deep where do you get that living water are you greater than our father jacob He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. But Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. To never thirst again. That your salvation, your trust in Jesus Christ is secure in him, not in yourself. You see, Jesus is enough. He is not the means to an end. You do not just say, Jesus, save me so that I can step into heaven. It is not hell insurance. But it is an eternal, it is a life that has been given over to him, that you would trust him, and that you would seek him, and that you would long for him, and that you would serve him. The life that Jesus gives is eternal. He bought it. He died for it. He wants you, and nothing can take that from you. Nothing at all. We we see in the Scripture, says, As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, we be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. How tragic it is to consider your life in continuous peril. To live as though you may not have said enough or done enough to be saved. Sure, it drives people to work and labor, but for what? So that they might experience heaven? It's false. They've got it backwards. If you truly believe and trust Jesus, it produces a desire, a well springing up in you to see others come to know him. We do not pack shoe boxes so that we can show the world, look how many boxes that we've packed. We do not pack them so that we can be in good favor with God. That is not the purpose at all. But it's because of the love of Christ that is in you that you pack the shoe boxes. It is in the the, the love of Christ that you serve in our community, that you give to uh, OCAC this last week. 
that you give to the International Mission Board at Christmas time, in Nam at, at, at Easter time. You do it not because of show, or you shouldn't do it because of show. You do it because of the love of Christ that wells up inside of you. Not to earn favor with God, but to serve Him. You see, that's what mercy is. Showing kindness when you deserve death. So live in the mercy of God. It's a really sweet place to be. You see, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing nor no one. Plain and simple, why would you ever want to leave? For many this morning, this seems like old news, and I understand that. But let me remind you, it is good news. It is good news. Remind yourself often of what Jesus rescued you from and lean harder into his mercy and his grace for some this morning this is news to you new news maybe not even new but you actually listen something inside of you says it's time it's time to trust Jesus with my life I don't have it with me because I left my wallet somewhere. But if I had a $20 bill, if I had a $20 bill standing up here this morning, I said the first one who ran up to the stage could have it. How many of you would run? A bunch of them. All the younger ones raised their, uh, Scott says no. It's not worth it, is it, Scott, to come this far for 20 A hundred dollar bill you'll get up for? Okay. But if I stood up here with a twenty dollar bill and I said the first one who runs up here and gets it, uh, they, they get to have it. You'd all, you'd all flood in, wouldn't you? But what about the gospel truth? Is it not worth way more than twenty bucks? A hundred bucks? Put a, can't put a price tag on it. So if you're willing to come up for $20, are you willing to come up for eternal life? This morning, Jesus offers something worth infinitely more than $20. The question is, will you take the first step this morning and step out of your chair and come drink from that well? I'm going to leave you with this great scripture from the end of times. It's a Revelation text. and This is Jesus' offering for you. Will you accept it? Revelation 22, 17 says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price will you drink from the well of life this morning and if not what's it going to take God is patient but God also loves you enough to not leave you where you are let's pray Father we thank and we praise you for your goodness and mercy We thank you for the hope that we have in the resurrection. We thank you for the the assurance that you have provided that it's not a maybe or possibly that you'll save us. But God, when we call on your name and trust you with our heart and confess with our mouth, Father, you will save. But Father, I just take this time to thank you for my salvation. The mercy and grace that you extend to a wretched sinner, Father, thank you so much for it. Father, each and every one of us is undeserving of your love, but, but your love is so great. Your love is so great that it, could, it, it can save a baby killer. Your love is so great that it can take the drug lord off the street corner and turn him into your gospel-proclaiming individual. That your gospel is so true and so perfect that that, that you can rescue the one from 
from slavery, that you can take the one who is in bondage in, in their marriage or in their lives, Father, and can set them free. And Father, you are the one who can take the vilest of sinners and use them for your glory. We saw you do it with, with Saul turned Paul. Father, right now I ask that you would you would go before us and that you would begin to prepare hearts for you. And we ask your spirit to call us to faith today. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. If you would stand and sing with us.